You're listening to the Biohackers World Podcast. Welcome back. I'm Josh Black, and I am super excited to be coming to you live from Chicago at Biohackers World. We're going to have a really, really awesome conversation today. Uh, I want to welcome Shah Haq. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank Shah, you tell us a little bit. You're with Oxygen Health Systems. I am, I've been looking forward to this conversation quite a bit. Uh, so I do a lot of longevity coaching, a lot of different modalities. Uh, and I think you know hyperbaric is sort of coming. It's trending now a little bit. People are starting to realize some of the benefits. But I want to talk a little bit first about how you got into this space. You have a, a fun <laughs> journey. So tell me a little bit. So um, <laughs> very good question. I also find myself. Uh, to be in this space sort of by accident. So the founder of the company, Michael Carroll and I, we were, we were Bell Labs nerds. We were Bell Labs engineers, electrical engineers, both by education. Uh, from there, when you work in a corporate environment, getting tired of this corporate indentured servitude in perpetuity, you figure out that you know there's something better that you can do. So after working for so many years with Bell Labs and Hewlett Packard, Nokia, and then finally had a, a stint with AbbVie, the third largest global pharmaceutical company. Um, I have a lot of respect for the pharmaceutical company coming from both inside and looking at it from outside as well. Um, when I learned that the AbbVie, the corporation that is well known for innovation, um, I started to think that what is it that we can do that would change both from the pharmacological perspective and also from the wellness perspective. And it just happened so at that time Michael Carroll had started the company, my former Bell Labs engineering colleague. And he was getting a bit of traction with the, the wellness, the nutrition, uh, and a whole bunch of other products. And at that time, unfortunately, he was also suffering from major health issues, such as he had stage four non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Mm. So it, it hit me personally quite a bit. So I left Abvi, joined him, two Bell Labs friends getting together, and then we started to say, what if? The HP, the Hewlett Packard philosophy, what if? What if we do this? What if we introduce the hyperbaric into this wellness space, and then rest is just snowball effect. I like the what if. The what if is a little bit similar to the why not, right? Or right. what, what are you afraid of? Right. You know, um, and I think too often we're af we're afraid of getting sued. We're afraid of you know. Uh, doing something negatively, uh, switching up our own routine. I mean, any of these things that are sort of silly, really, you know, right. I mean, in reality, those risks are, are pretty small. So talk, let, let's now transition. So you, so you got involved, you started in this hyperbaric world, right? Um, AbbVie, by the way, for anybody who's interested, is just sort of like up the street from where we're at right now. So it's sort of in our backyard. Um, but talk to me a little bit about how this journey of discovery and first of all, let's talk about what HBOT is, right, for the folks who may not know. I mean, right. people may see it trending in their feed. They may see sort of these submarine-looking things, right? Uh, talk to us a little bit about what that is. So HBOT is basically an old technology that has emerged over the last few decades in a new form. HBOT stands for Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy. There are two types of HBOT. One is MHBOT, M is in small. That's a mild hyperbaric, so anything that's under 1.5 ATA, or approximately 52 kilopascal. And then you have the full HBOT, which is the 1.5 ATA or greater. Now it can go as high as 3, 4, 5 ATA, but the question is, in normal human being, you're in great health, Josh, can you get to 2.4 or 3.0 at a reasonable amount of time? The question is, um, would you be able to do that healthy, in a healthy sure. manner? So 2.0, after Dr. Shai Efrati did his clinical studies at uh, Tel Aviv University, became extremely popular. And that was deemed to be a safe pressure 
because it's not really 2.4, it doesn't really require a long getting adjusted acclimation time and so on and so forth. So that became extremely popular, the 2.0. So the difference between the irregular hyperbaric and the mild, once again, recap, the cap is anything that's under 1.5, that would be considered mild. Anything that's greater than 1.5 uh, greater, that would be considered the uh, the regular H bar, and, and this is the pressure, right? This, this is, is the this pressure. Is the pressure. Yeah. So, uh, keep, one thing to keep in mind that when you are taking oxygen from uh, regular air, which is the constituent of air, seventy-eight percent nitrogen and twenty-one percent oxygen, you're really not getting that oxygen in a compressed manner. What H bar does, it takes the pressure as it increases, and you're constantly pumping more compressed air of which 21% is oxygen, you are adding increased number of moles. And that gets absorbed into your blood plasma. Your primary oxygen transport mechanism is hemoglobin, 98%, uh, you know, 98.5. And then the additional one, one to one and a half percent would be through plasma. By inducing the pressure, now you're increasing the plasma infused oxygen as the oxygen is getting through the 100,000 kilometer of your vascular network. And that's where we're making the oxygen so available the, throughout the This body. is super fascinating. So, I mean, I know that we've got, we're, we're going a little deep here. So I want to sort of pull it back for a minute and, and connect this to something that I think a lot of, of the audience may understand. You know, when we talk about VO2 max, right, as a predictor of longevity, part of that is the body's, well, not part of it, it is the actual way that your body efficiency and how your body is using oxygen, right? And Correct. so so if we sort of connect at a super high level, right, the idea that we're actually getting more oxygen in our cells, in our blood, throughout our entire body, it, like, do the math on that, right? I mean, th there are a lot of upstream things that that affect when we're, when we're doing that sort of at the base level. Correct. How does that play into something like VO2 max? What, what do we, would, you know, what would we expect? So there are two types of hyperbaric that you can use. One is the regular hyperbaric at BMR, basal metabolic rate. And then there's another hyperbaric that some athletes do, the exercise in it. The VO2 max that you refer to is the VO2 max based hyperbaric. So it would allow you to have that increased VO2 max when you're doing the exercise. Now the world record, I believe this Scandinavian guy, he consumed about 100 milliliter per kg per minute. Now he did a huge amount of practice and sure. that's how you got to that level. Normally you and I are breathing right now between three and a half, between three to three and a half milliliter per kg per minute of oxygen. When you do exercise in hyperbaric, your VO2 max through that exercise getting greater absorption into the plasma and available of oxygen throughout the body, you are potentially creating a platform to increase that. Hence, the indicator for longevity. So you do, I, I read through some of the notes right before we talked, I know that you've done a lot of work with some professional athletes and teams. So sort of, you know, continuing this sort of line, right? What, like, what are you seeing? What kind of improvements are you seeing? And what, what is the overall feeling in professional sports? Because, you know, a lot of times when you have new modalities, right. I always tell folks, look at horses and professional athletes, right? Like big money in horses, big money in professional athletics. Those are two places that we can look to sort of like validate some of these, you know, these Correct. things. Correct. So from the professional perspective, trend basically drives. But when you are talking about professional team, they don't fall for the trend. They go by what their director of sports medicine, director of high performance, um, and equivalent title. They are physicians. So they not only take a look at the trend, they also look at the numbers. For example, in um, our case as providers, we had helped New York Yankees, New York Giants. That little half a second to a second performance gain would spell a win or a loss. Or Pittsburgh Penguins, which is uh, uh, the team where they put their tr uh, players through this session and then they literally measure their performance. So once you have measurable performance or matrix that can be quantified not only through numbers but also in the field, you know it's not only a trend. So the teams that we've supported 
I've already mentioned uh, Twins, the Yankees, the Giants, Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, oh, um, Inter uh, Miami, where Messi is right now. Um, um, San Diego Padres, or some of the world boxing champions, such as Canelo Alvarez. He's also reached out to us, and he also is using hyperbaric. So, so what does that look like in the, in, the, in the professional context? And then I want to bring it back to what this means for everybody else, right? But what does that mean in a professional context? How often are these guys, you know, as part of the toolkit, right? Because I think it's important that everybody understands whether it's vitamin D or hyperbaric, Correct. right? It's part of a toolkit of things. Nothing is is a, uh, a, we're not solving aging, right? We're not solving optimization with one tool, right? We have multiple mm -hmm. tools that we're using and this is one of those tools. So, right. so what does that look like as far as that tool? How often are they using it? Like what is that, you know, how does that work? For a typical professional team, they would make them available either at their, I'll just use a baseball example, spring training. Or in the case of a field stadium, uh, they would make them available in their home base stadiums. And then they train their uh, you know, players how to use this machine. And it's self-sustaining, meaning they can go in at any given hours. We have created the instructions on how to use it. It's very important to make it self-sustainable. Once they follow the instruction, they have a log and then the director of high performance under which you have the trainer, they get to measure how often they've used and they have a protocol that this many number of times you should be using. General recommendation is three to five times a week. Uh, if the players cannot find the time, make it up as you go and then each session should last about 60 to 90 minutes. So in the case of let's say Chicago Fire, not too far from here, um, they put their players through those regiments and then they measure their performance. I have spoken to some of these players myself and I would ask them, hey, uh, can you quantify some of the uh, performance gains that you have received? And they would tell me that you know, now they have, they have a lot more energy in the field. They get to kick or they you know, get to do certain things in a manner that they thought was not possible. So is that, is that through sort of like enhanced recovery more than anything else? It's both because when you're in the when you're in the field and you're exerting your body and pushing your body to the limit, you do create micro tear, and that micro tear, without the oxygen therapy, may or may not get adequate time, the T, to repair. By putting that oxygen modality, H bot modality, now you're compensating for that recovery time. So you are actually enhancing the recovery building the, with the proper diet, building the recovery time um, frame from here to a very shorter period of time, and now you're back ready, back ready meaning you're ready to go back to the field doing that same performance. And when you do this repeated number of times, your benefits would continue to. So you're in saying the body. this is almost like going to the gym and, and, and lifting or running or exactly. any of those other things, right? That we sort of like layer and build, and the more that we use an HBOT, the greater the benefit. Josh, you gave a fantastic example. Yes, when you go to the gym, you cause a micro tear and you replenish and then you go back, give it a rest, and then you keep doing that. And that's how you build muscle. Same thing here. You're putting oxygen repairing and now you have the greater capa you know, capability of absorbing more oxygen and repair. So what about folks who actually have an injury, right? So let's, let's sort of move to the, the folks, like, I mean, obviously I'm going to the gym and lifting, so I have those little micro tears, right? Correct. Every four days a week, <laughs> right, right, when I'm going. But that sort of is not an injury, that, 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 is a, that is a good stressor, right? But what about the folks that have a meniscus tear or a rotator cuff injury or a calf strain? How does this really benefit them in their recovery? Gotcha. So there's a concept called angiogenesis. In a normal one ATM, your oxygen transport mechanism may or may not be able to supply the oxygen to replenish the loss that the body has incurred in, a, uh, in an injury. So what the HBOT does, it, through this compressed oxygen and as we're pumping more and more air, 
it's accumulating the number of moles, and that greater number of moles would create a pathway for angiogenesis or so, new blood formation. So, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, so, so angiogenesis is new blood cell formation or blood vessel formation, right, um, which is important. And so, so this, it sounds like, I actually know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, but it sounds like this is the type of thing that you stack with like a peptide stack, like a BPC and a TB, right? Absolutely. To sort of support the formation of that, because if we were to use a BPC, TB, and copper, right, blend, which sure. is uh, which is sort of a recovery protocol, right. would you do that before getting in the HBOT? in order to sort of maximize and like stack? How does that work? So there are two schools of thought. <clears throat> the most popular school of thought, let's say you're taking BPC-157. What the physician would say, of course, you know, always consult your physicians, nothing always. without the, yeah. So what the physician would say, in order to make it more bioavailable throughout your 100,000 kilometer of capillary network, do that just before hyperbaric. So now it has dissolved and you're going into the hyperbaric, it would have greater probability of traveling through the, the almost, you know, much length of that, a good chunk of that length of 100,000 kilometer. So you'd combine the two, or you combine something else, red light, or you combine, you know, other protocol, as your physician would say, you know, let's just combine these because they logically make sense as you go into the chamber and then extend throughout your body by putting yourself or your body through under tremendous pressure. So, I mean, this is this stuff is fascinating to me personally, so I always love like, like talking about this. What about those in the audience that are really curious about the evidence behind this, right? So I'm a Medicine 3.0 guy. Sorry, I'm just gonna whack my, my microphone. I'm, an, I'm a Medicine 3.0 guy. I love evidence, right? I love studies, I love the data, and you, know, right. you, you, you talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, what data do we have? I mean, this is an older technology, so we do have you know some history here. Correct. What, what's the actual data behind Behind this? Very good question. Um, I, coming from a science background, so are you, Josh, uh, always rely on data, data, data. And the data would have to be a credi credible source. So you go to PubMed, NIH, um, clinicaltrials.gov. These are PubMed, NIH, that's our nation's, no nation's number one custodian for clinical data. Mm -hmm. uh, Carnegie Mellon, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, number one institution for preventive medicine. Uh, Tel Aviv University uh, uh, Research Centers. And you would see, away from those 13 indications that have already been approved by FDA, now physicians, surgeons, and clinicians alike are exploring the additional technology that are emerging. So if you go to those sites, you would always find that there are clinical data also is suggesting there are reported benefits. In some cases, additional research or clinical trials are needed, and in other cases, they are very close to getting the benefits you know, published in credible journals. So know that um, the emerging technology, I truly believe in clinical data and, and attested information and numbers, know that they're getting closer and closer every single year. And in the meantime, a large number of people, be that professional athletes, be that clinicians, be that plastic surgeons, be that doctors, MDs, DCs, are saying, hey, a good chunk of our patients reported this benefit. So just put those two together. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. You have one more minute. Okay, thanks. So for the audience who's, who's watching and who maybe is sort of interested now in trying this, what is a good way for them to start getting involved and trying this as part of you know, their routine? Well, one way to um, get involved would be reach out to the companies who are actually providing that. You know, we are from Oxygen Health Systems providing 40 different models of this chamber and find out what is the best model for you. What is the model that would be best suited for your application? If you're a plastic surgeon, you know, reach out and figure out for your neck up or neck down plastic surgery, what kind of chamber would be best for your patient? Comfort, the the ease of use, the, the um, sustainability and all of those you know you need to find that uh, and then reach out and take the action this is great I would I, I feel like there's a lot more to be had here and since you're in Chicago I'd love to have you back on so that we can maybe get like a full 60 or 90 minutes and go 
deep. We'll love it, Josh. Um, so, so let's do that again. But uh, for now, Shah, this has been a pleasure. I appreciate that. I hope that this has been helpful for everybody here. Remember, we're live from Chicago. I um, hope this was uh, an eye-opening, uh, data-driven conversation. And uh, we can't wait to see you next time. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Come join us at Biohacker Miami, November 1st and 2nd.